Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, and welcome back to the Nano Hub U course Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. We're moving toward the end of week four, which is about the Landauer transport formalism. And today we're going to talk about the quantum of thermal conductance. For those of you who have studied electrical engineering, you might have seen the quantum of electrical conductance. And there is, in fact, an equivalent uh, concept for heat transfer. And today we're going to go through that. First, I want to remind you about our normalized spectral conductance. Uh, the, the terminology is important to follow. I apologize for all of the odd symbols that we have to use, but, uh, but I think that it, it, everything should hang together reasonably well if you just kind of think about G as being a conductance and Q as being uh, representing heat, and then anything else that we add to it, we're going to add one more thing today uh, in addition to what we have. Anything we're adding to it, the prime means spectral, the tilde means that it's normalized, and as we talked about last time, the normalization has involves a constant, a couple of constants actually, the number of modes and the transmission function. So there's a, some slight differences between phonons and electrons. Uh, this this uh, symbol chi stands for a normalized energy, and we've spoken about that quite a bit so far. But the nice thing is that our normalized spectral conductance is dimensionless. And we showed this graph the last time uh, that we, we have this normalized conductance that takes a value of 1 for very low energies. And the energy, again, is scaled. This, is, this would be for phonons. So we're, we're looking at h bar omega normalized by kBT. And it takes a value of 1 when energy is low. And then as soon as the energy rises appreciably above uh, the thermal energy, kBT, then the spectral conductance drops off very rapidly. And we said in the last lecture that that's a function that we ought to be able to integrate the area under this curve. And indeed, that's what we're going to do today. If we look at this, we're going to first of all make some assumptions. We're going to say that we have an ideal one-dimensional phonon conductor. That's going to be kind of the basis for this idea of the quantum of thermal conductance. So what does ideal mean? It means that the conductor has perfect transmission. We haven't talked yet enough about transmission to, to know much different, but with this one, in this case, we're assuming that the transmission function is unity. Some people will call that ballistic. That means that there's no scattering events. There's nothing to keep, uh, keep the carriers from flowing through the device. We'll also assume that we have a one-dimensional phonon conductor. That means that M, the number of modes, by definition equals 1. When we calculated the number of modes for one-dimensional conduction for conductors, uh, that's what we found, m equals 1. Very simple. So now we're going to introduce a new uh, variant on g, and we're going to put a hat on it. So this hat means that it's the quantum of thermal conductance. And the calculation is shown here. If we express the integral that we've used, in the past, normally we put it in terms of frequency. Here we're putting it in terms of chi, meaning that it's dimension, it's dimensionless. And so to, to make it that integral dimensionless, we had to pull some constants out in front. And then you can do the algebra for this. It's not too difficult. But it's a fairly simple um, integral. We have a square of the Bose-Einstein distribution function, so that may be a little bit complicated. Uh, but in fact, it's something that we can successfully integrate analytically. Um, and so again, that function is, and we expect that the, the term that's integrated will have a value of roughly one, of order one, because the, the highest magnitude of, of this uh, normalized spectral conductance is one, that's for low energies, and then it drops off once chi gets above one. And so we expect the area under this curve in these units, uh, in these coordinates, I should say, to be approximately one. It's a little bit larger than that. If you look at the curve, you might expect it to be a little bit larger, and it is. And so this ballistic thermal conductivity uh, is what we find is that we have a, a when we think about thermal conductivity, uh, it's actually a thermal conductance 
multiplied by the length over which heat flows divided by some cross-sectional area uh, of the conductor. And if we have a ballistic conductor, then this isn't very useful because the conductance is in fact not, it, it doesn't cancel out the length dependencies that we see here. And so, so kappa is not a very useful property in, in such circumstances, although you'll find it calculated quite a bit or measured quite a bit, but it no longer has that, the power of a, a property that can kind of transcend the size of the object on which you're applying that property. And so I just wanted to, to point that out, that it's something that you have to be careful with thermal conductivity in particular, because if you have ballistic heat, heat flow like we do in this, the problem that we're studying today, then there are then the actual thermal conductivity or the apparent thermal conductivity will depend intimately on the length and the area, the size, the dimensions of the problem. So the integral that we showed before indeed can be evaluated analytically, and the, the result is shown here. We find that the quantum of thermal conductance is proportional to temperature. And I want to be very clear, this is for a one-dimensional conductor. Um, and so if we had higher dimensions, essentially we would take this quantum of conductance and we would have to add modes to it. The higher dimensions add more, a higher number of modes. And that's why this value seems very low. Temperature times essentially 10 to the minus 12. Um, you, you would think that you know, how could you transfer heat? And what we're used to, I think in, in most folks, when they're looking at cooling problems, uh, cooling technologies, we'd like to have things that are about of order one watt per Kelvin, but clearly uh, that's not going to happen with one quantum of thermal conductance. So uh, Rigo and Kersnow are the first to, to actually uh, calculate this and show the linear dependence in theory. And, uh, and you know, this is the, I, I will add, this is the maximum heat flow that can occur in in our contact device contact structure um, we've because we've assumed that we have a perfect an ideal conductor with no transmission losses well it turns out in in some seminal work um, that's listed here that that the quantum of thermal conductance has been measured and uh, it was a very very intricate measurement um, they had to make uh, a number of different one-dimensional conductors or waveguides. They had to make sure that the coupling was very good between the devices and the thermal reservoirs so that there was, again, that ideal transmission. So the transmission functions were very close to unity. Um, and also they had to, to configure the sample so that they had enough uh, resolution, experimental resolution, to actually measure what is a tiny amount of heat flow. So this is the structure that was used to measure the quantum of thermal conductance. There's a heater and temperature sensor in the middle, and it is suspended, and the, the uh, lines of suspension are, are the actual conductors. There's four of them. And you can see that on the temperature scale in the graph, the temperatures that they were using were very, very low, less than a Kelvin to get to see the actual plateau to the quantum of thermal conductance. And the units here are a little bit different. And in fact, there's, there's a factor of 16. And the si factor of 16 comes from the, the fact that they were summing over four acoustic-like modes. Okay, so this material, these bridges, had four modes in them. There's, a, there's an extra acoustic-like mode that comes from the fact that you have a very thin structure. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, perhaps we'll have some time to talk about that with respect to graphene. Um, and then the other factor of four, so we had four acoustic modes multiplied by the four bridges or waveguides. And that's why you had this factor of 16. And you'll notice that when the temperature became very low, that in, that the plateau, it, the, the value, the measured value plateaus to a normalized unit of one, which means that it's it, it, they were truly measuring the uh, quantum of thermal conductance. As temperature increases, what's happening here is that these bridges are not all that small. You'll notice in the in the scale bar in the uh, figure C here, that's not a, you know, just an atomically thin layer. It's actually quite thick. So what they had to do was to go to ultra low temperatures where only one mode could survive in each of those 
of those branches, uh, those four acoustic branches. And so that's why they had to go to the very low temperatures. As they increased temperature beyond about one Kelvin or a thousand millikelvin, what was happening was the conductors were acting more like two-dimensional carriers or two-dimensional conductors. And so they had a width. And so, and as we, they were essentially adding modes, as we talked about in the previous lecture, and we had a width where more and more modes were fitting in the cross section of the carriers. And that's why you see the, the conductance scaled by the quantum of thermal conductance increasing for higher temperatures. Well, I'll, I'll add here as, as a final thought that electrons also, we can calculate a quantum of thermal conductance for electrons. And it's essentially the same thing, although the, the range of integration changes because, again, we're going uh, on either side of the chemical potential. So we have to do our energy integral, not from zero to infinity, but from the, uh, from the bottom of the conduction band to, to infinity. And if you have a very, if you have a, a very low temperature, uh, KBT, relative to the chemical potential, you can approximate the lower bound in this integral. And the integral is the same as the one we had for phonons, except for the fact that the distribution function is the Fermi-Dirac distribution function, not the Bose-Einstein distribution function. The value of that integral when we make the approximation listed on the lower bound is actually the same. It's pi squared over three. It's the same that we had for phonons. And the final result looks an awful lot like what we had for phonons. It's different by a factor of two. And that factor of two, again, comes from spin degeneracy. So I, I'm not aware of, of any experiments that have measured the quantum of thermal conductance for electrons, but uh, give me some feedback if, if you know of some measurements, and, and I'd be interested in looking at them. All right, that's all for today. The last lecture of week four will come next. That'll be a, a summary, a wrap-up for the week. I'll see you then.